Добро вечер на сите. Good evening everyone. I'd like to welcome you at this event. Thank you for your participation. I'd like to thank all the speakers who are here with us today. We will discuss the topics uh, just transition on energy democracy. The first topic the first session on the first, uh, during the first session we will talk about just transition this is the first uh, of the many events of the jeff that will uh, take uh, place in the following period uh, we have some uh, Attendees here from the European Union, we will discuss the economy, the economy before and during this pandemic. Together we will discuss the uh, trends in the economy here in Macedonia and uh, Europe. You will have access to uh, certain researches and reports that uh, will take place here in our country, but also in Europe, with the aim to improve our practices. How shall we transform our economy from destructive to a regenerative economy? We will discuss uh, how to uh, make the transition from the economy we have today into something better. We have a few speakers who will discuss the same topic from different perspectives and uh, who will share their thoughts, their opinions, their practices. We have to take into consideration the social and the circular economy. And with this project, we will be able to uh, know how to detect many uh, problems and find uh, solutions to make uh, to make this the transition possible. Without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce the session, the speakers of the session. Uh, Dirk Holmans, uh, representative of uh, Jeff, and. Uh, a founder of Oikos. He will talk about the project of uh, Just Transition. Next uh, speaker will be Maya Moracanin, an MP in the Assembly of Macedonia. She will talk about the struggle against mining. And then Anna Petrovska, uh, head of uh, State Environmental Inspectorate, will talk about uh, the environmental enforcement and instrument for Just Transition. I will uh, send you the link uh, in the chat. You can register for the Jeff Journal. If you want to be informed of the latest information regarding uh, these topics. I'd like to encourage you to to be uh, to be careful listeners attentive and you can also feel free to uh, ask questions now i'd like to ask dirk to uh, take the floor okay uh, i hope you all can hear me well uh, and first of all i really want to say that it's uh, it's really sad i we cannot be together as Alexander knows, I love to come to North Macedonia. I really enjoyed former meetings. So uh, let's say this is a one-time digital meeting and next year we meet again uh, in a normal way. First uh, discussing content and then having a good beer together. Sorry for that, I'm from Belgium. Um, so the topic today is just transition. Um, it is the topic of a transnational project of the Green European Foundation, which is a foundation that uh, brings together all different uh, green foundations and think tanks from all over Europe. And in this project, uh, and that's typical for all transnational projects, 
we work together with uh, colleagues from all over Europe. So really to integrate uh, different perspectives, because I think this is really key to Europe. Yes, there is diversity. Yes, regions are different, but at the same time, by working together, by cooperating, we can strengthen each other and we can all learn from each other and, and strive like this for a better world. In this project, for instance, we are not only with people from North Macedonia and Belgium, but we also have colleagues from uh, England. Yes, also after Brexit, England is still Europe. We have uh, colleagues also from Spain, South Europe that also face specific challenges. Um, just transition is, um, yeah, let's say part of the answer to the big challenges we face as society. And to elaborate on this, I will use a PowerPoint. And so I now will, will try to share my screen. Here we go. So do you see my screen? Everything is okay? Then uh, probably I don't have to tell you this, but I think it's always important to really uh, emphasize this as a starting point is that if we look at the main ecological crises, climate change, but also the decline of biodiversity, we are really uh, in a kind of unprecedented situation and uh, it's really time now to act. We don't, we cannot lose another year to say so. That's also what Greta Thunberg tells uh, all the time. Uh, actually, the, uh, the next 10 years will be crucial if we want to leave the earth as a livable and enjoyable space and place for our children. I think this is a crucial starting point. And so therefore we need system change. All the reports, whether it's on biodiversity or on climate change, climate change emphasize the same. Just greening the current system is not enough. It will not bring any solution. We need radical system change, transformation of how we produce stuff, how we produce energy, how we transport things, uh, the food, how we produce our food and so further. And just transition is one of these key principles, kind of framework that we can use to guide us to uh, ecological society that is just and equitable. And uh, I will explain in a moment that it was developed first by the labor unions, but I think the very positive development is that last year's labor unions, but also climate movements, uh, are using the concept of just transition if they, because they work now together uh, for systemic transformation while taking into account workers' rights and livelihoods. And to give one concrete example, during the first COVID crisis uh, in Belgium, as in many countries, our uh, air company was in trouble and they asked for state support. And it was for the first time that labor unions and climate movement worked together on a common position, saying, of course, people who, people who work uh, there, they uh, need an income, but we don't have to save an air company. Uh, so that's really something new thing emerging. Also, I think very important is, is the huge protest in France, uh, Les Gilets Jaunes, the yellow vests. Uh, people were really protesting because the French government introduced a so-called environment, environmental tax, but it was just a tax on car fuel after they just had cut down taxes for the rich. And so if you, do, if you don't take into account the real living situations of people, for instance, people living in the countryside where they really need their car to go to work because there's no public transport. If you don't take these realities of life into consideration, you will never uh, be able to really implement uh, this transformation. 
And of course, uh, I don't have to explain you, uh, the current COVID-19 crisis is like a mirror. It shows us the already existing problems, inequality, ecological crisis uh, is even more uh, visible due to the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, I think this is a really uh, strong uh, sentence. It's from the Secretary General of the Global uh, Workers' Movement. There are no jobs on a dead planet. I think this really shows that also people from the labor union are well aware of the importance of tackling the ecological crisis and that uh, we really need to embed just transition in a bigger context. So just transition is not, ju it's not only about people maybe in a mining company that will lose their job that we have to support them, which is very important, but the frame is that we really have to transform the economic and political structures that reproduce and exacerbate inequalities and part will be the creation of employment that promotes labor rights and improves working conditions while also encompassing gender and racial equality, democratic participation and social justice. So it's really the different dimensions of this uh, goal of uh, justice that is included. This also means that we have to discuss what it means economic prosperity, what does it mean social well-being. So very quick, something on the uh, history. So it was already in the 1970s when in the United States environmental legislation was introduced that some workers group risked to lose their job and therefore uh, a trade union leader, uh, Tony Machoksi, said we need a fund that will provide financial support and opportunities for education for workers displaced by environmental protection policies. So it's something already going on for decades, uh, this analysis. And at the end of the 1990s, uh, the trade unions really incorporated the concept of just transition. And uh, the trade union movements also put this concept of just transition on the table of the international climate debate. For instance, at the Kyoto conference or also the COP16 in Cancun, uh, they put it on the table and with the COP21, which, as you know, is very important, where the Climate Agreement of Paris uh, was established, uh, just transition became an integral element of the international climate policy framework. So it's not something uh, theoretical in the air. It's really something that is now integrated in important uh, policy uh, agreements. And also, last but not least, decent work is also in, uh, incorporated in the sustainable development goals. It's SDG number eight. Now, if we look at uh, which international institutions are playing a key role, it is the International Labour Organization that's really uh, key here. The ELO published in 2015, already a set of guidelines to facilitate the transition towards a green economy. And these guidelines are kind of a uh, hallmark for, for just transition policies worldwide. And you can find this report very easily uh, on the internet. And I don't go, I'm not gonna read all these uh, little uh, sentences but uh, it's clear uh, what it's a definition of what should be done uh, in, in, on just transition. It's about, uh, it requires a current country specific mix of macroeconomic, industrial, sectoral and labor policies. So I think this is already very important. Uh, every country has to develop its own just uh, transition uh, policies. The things needed in North Macedonia are not the same as the things needed in uh, Belgium. Uh, to give one example, we already closed our last coal mine in the 70s. Uh, 
And second, very important point is that as the challenge cuts across several domains, you really need a kind of coherent policy packets addressing all policy fields. Uh, these two points are then translated to what the government should do and what social partners should do. Uh, and I think the key here is um, social dialogue at all stages from policy design to implementation and evaluation. And also social dialogue at all levels from the concrete factory to the national level. Um, and of course, the social partners have to really play an active role here. Now, I'm not going to be very academic and, and, and uh, discuss different definitions, but I just want to show you that there are uh, differences of how just transition is being defined and it's have a uh, kind of different definition. Of course, there's a lot of common ground. So uh, I think this is most important, but it's good to know that there are also some nuances. So uh, the labor movement really focuses on securing the future and the livelihood of workers and communities in a transition to a low carbon economy. So that's really the key point, uh, livelihood of workers and communities uh, for the trade unions. If we then move to a, a definition by an environmental movement, Friends of the Earth, we find a much broader approach. Just in the concept, just transition, they say, for us, this refers to some chance of a safe climate for future generations, which means that we have to discuss the fair distribution of the remaining global carbon budget between countries. And so also uh, the distribution of the costs related to the transition. So I, you see, this is a much broader definition, but as I said, there's a lot of common ground, uh, which is of course the most crucial. Another point all um, documents on just transition emphasize is that you have to work at different levels. Sometimes you have to work uh, at the level of one company or one sector. Uh, for instance, the electricity sector is of course very much affected by just transition, but also uh, a region. A good example is the Ruhr region in Germany which used to be a region full of uh, mines, coal mines and steel factories. And it took them many, many uh, years and a lot of money to really uh, have a successful uh, conversion to other act economic activities. But also on the level of um, countries, uh, regions of countries, we have to discuss just transition, of course, also the European Union and global scale. So it's really on the different scales we have to put into practice the different uh, perspectives and measures. So what are necessary or some of the necessary elements in a just transition process? As I said, there has to be a social dialogue, which is inclusive. You really have to include all the different uh, stakeholders. Also, uh, it's uh, organized mostly on a regional basis. So you need inclusive social and regional dialogue. It's clear that you need measures to mitigate negative effects on workers. So you need to support them. This can, for instance, be a kind of, uh, for a certain time, an income guarantee. It is clear that in the transition, it are specific regions and communities that are uh, yeah, hurt the most. So you really need specific support for these regions and communities. But also, and I think this relates to the process of the uh, Yellow Vests in France, it's also this vision of enabling all citizens to live a sustainable life, which means that you have to also to invest in uh, infrastructures. As I said, a lot of the protest of the yellow vest in France was 
of people living at the countryside because they need their car, because there's very little um, public transport, there are very little jobs in the region where they live. So if you want to enable these people to live a sustainable life, it's also about investing in infrastructures for decent life, uh, public transport, new economic activities so people can find a job close home and so on. And as I said, of course, uh, supporting affected companies and farmers because uh, most of the examples that normally are given in the field of just transition are of course industrial activities or uh, think of steel companies, think of uh, mining, but also farmers. Uh, and of course, the situation of farmers uh, is much different in different countries. Uh, but to give the example of Belgium, a lot of farmers are stuck in a, a, a kind of model of industrial agro-business. And uh, to get out of this uh, kind of lock-in in the system, they also need support. So then to finish, uh, a look at the European Union and uh, its policies. As you all know, um, and I say personally, I find it uh, very exciting. Uh, you can have a lot of critique on the Green Deal, but if you compare the ambition of the current Commission to the lack of ambition of the former Commission uh, with Juncker, this is really a very Interesting, you have von der Leyen, who is a Christian Democrat, and you have uh, Timmermans, who is a social Democrat, who are really, really trying to push towards a very uh, green uh, again agenda. As I said, uh, you have to stay critical, and a lot of things are not ambitious enough, but if you compare it to uh, the European Union a few years ago, this is really a change. And so really, uh, the ambition to achieve climate neutrality in the European Union um, in 2050 and also the fact that the European Parliament said it's not ambitious enough, we want to be, even have higher ambition, it's really something. And of course, we don't know who will be elected in the United States, but imagine Biden get elected uh, and he will join again the Paris Climate Agreement also last week, China said they want to become a climate neutral by 2060. So I think if we are optimistic, we could see the big powers of, of the world really embracing this agenda of, green, of a Green Deal. The Green Deal, uh, it's a very uh, ambitious and complex um, policy packet. And I'm not going to explain uh, everything. But here you see some elements. So uh, it's transition to a circular economy. It's, as I said, also uh, a policy on agriculture, farm to fork. It's about also uh, mobility, sustainable transport, but it's also, for instance, about uh, the financial sector uh, with the green financing strategy. It's also about energy. And here you also see very explicitly uh, just transition with really the goal of leaving no one behind. Um, and so therefore the European Union um, has created the Just Transition Fund, which is a funding mechanism composed of three main pillars in order to allocate funding for regions in part to carbon neutral EU and also to ensure this happens in a fair and just way. And these uh, three main pillars are economic uh, conversion. Let's say support uh, the startup of new economies. Second is the social support of which I uh, spoke already. It can be uh, providing uh, training. It can be providing income guarantee. And the third point is land restoration. Uh, if you close a mining area or an area full of uh, steel companies, you have to invest in uh, land restoration, for instance, to make it again usable for agriculture or also for 
uh, maybe a kind of sustainable tourism. Uh, of course, uh, and this I think is our points of debate, overall the EU policy is still talking about green growth, uh, economic growth, and of course how growth of the economy is compatible with environmental limits, planetary boundaries is a point of discussion, uh, as even the USCD in one of its latest reports says that our economic model is broken. But just to point out that we have to be conscious about this. Uh, of course, it's not because the Green Deal includes the just transition that there are no challenges or no points to really uh, look into closer. One of the challenges will be overcoming the focus on national allocations. So this country gets more than us and so on. Uh, second challenge is moving beyond the energy production. It's not only about energy and the more obvious carbon intensive industries, but as I said, we are talking about uh, systemic transport and construction are really affected uh, sectors. And of course, uh, it cannot be done by the policy group itself. We have to work together with the stakeholders, with the private sector. But of course, policies have to set targets and, and timelines, for instance, for the really clear phase out of fossil fuels. Now to end a few case studies. Uh, Canada is a really heavy exporter of fossil fuels, especially the region of Alberta. There are more than 200,000 people work directly in the oil, gas and coal sectors, and even hundreds of thousands more work in jobs indirectly tied to those industries. But uh, already in 2015, there was a plan agreed to accelerate the transition away from coal power. And this led three years later that uh, the Alberta Federation of Labor secured a transition settlement for coal workers, which means that uh, there's a future for coal workers. And so the Federation of Labor is not against the closure of the mines. <clears throat> Another example is uh, Spain, where there has been a deal between the trade unions and the government where the government makes available more than 200 million for an investment. And so um, there's really a, a timeline and a decision to phase out all coal-fired plants. And as of July this year, seven plants ceased operation and four more will soon follow, putting Spain on track to ultimately become coal-free and uh, I know energy here is not the main topic, but I just want to add here that um, renewable energy, uh, sun and, and, and wind, is becoming so cheap, cheaper every year, that also just from a, a market perspective, uh, whether you're green, red, blue, or whatever, even from a market perspective, it doesn't make sense anymore to invest in, in coal mines. Uh, it's just uh, the Average, average costs to produce a kilowatt gets cheaper every year if you use wind or solar. Last example, and because I don't want to give only the nice examples, in South Africa, there's also some work being done on just transition uh, because there uh, they are afraid of job losses and um, a lot of the South African economy is uh, reliant on minerals and energy consumption. And there, uh, yeah, there's a kind of quasi inertia in terms of implementation of just transition principles. So here, at the moment, things are stuck. We also have to be clear that it's not just something easy that will work everywhere. Uh, it really sometimes is a very difficult situation. Conclusion, and just uh, I decided not to put conclusions because uh, I'm just offering uh, a framework. Uh, and of course, one of the points I, I uh, emphasized was that uh, you need country specific uh, perspective and solutions. And therefore, I think only people active in specific country 
can provide this. So therefore, I very humble to stop here. And I'm very eager to listen to the next speakers who will then uh, talk with really a knowledge uh, of their country. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dirk. You managed to talk about a lot of things uh, in such a short time. This really affects us and concerns us since we try to uh, switch from uh, an economy that pollutes into an economy that pollutes even more. We are aware that we use coal in large quantities. We are aware that uh, we have problems with the distribution of waste. You mentioned that in Belgium, you closed the coal mines in the 70s. So in this context, we will, we will continue with the, the uh, representative from the Green Party, the leader of the Green Party, Maya Moracanin who will uh, discuss the uh, struggle against mining. Maya will take the floor now. Thank you, Alexander, and welcome to Israel Sonce Gefant, everybody. I'm really happy that I have the opportunity to talk about, to talk at this panel discussion. I really believe that just transition is the economical model of the future. And what's really important and what we emphasize is when we talk about transition in relation in relation of course the social aspect of the transition has to be incorporated together with the transition if we talk about just transition. The social uh, dialogue among all stakeholders is very important, but as well as the support uh, for the vulnerable groups, enterprises during that whole procedure of transitioning, which is very complex. And that's uh, what we as Greens uh, often emphasize, that the ecology and the social justice go hand in hand together and that one doesn't exclude the other and that uh, the economy can also uh, be developed in the right way to produce economic well-being for the citizens but uh, it should be done together with uh, respecting the principles for climate neutrality and protection of the environment and the climate. Taking this into regard, the transition from circular economy, that is from the current linear to the circular economy, is a concept which uh, is being talked about and is being practiced for a long time in some countries in the European Union. And what's important here as a simple explanation is that the current model of the linear economy means uh, exhausting of all the uh, renewable resources of the planet for the goals of the industry. And in this process, we get lots of uh, amounts of waste which is being uh, put somewhere and which affects negatively the environment and people's health. This is unsustainable concept of development. That's why we have to position towards the circular economy, which is based on the principles of renewing, repairing products and recycling. So that as a result of this process, we will get less and less amount of waste, which would be put away. In this talk, I would like to emphasize a positive example, 
even though it is still a process that is ongoing, the struggle to close uh, mining in the Republic of North Macedonia. But I would like to share my experience from the last five years when this struggle against opening new mines began. Uh, it was talked about uh, mining which produced copper. And we talked to the citizens of the places where those mines were supposed to be located uh, and built. During that moment, the public wasn't aware, not even the local communities were aware, that concessions have been issued for geological uh, research, as well as concession to start working with the exploitation or that is building the mines. Firstly, the mine in Kazandol was authorized, as well as the mine in Ilovica, which are in the southeast part of the country. And the population reacted. They were against building these kind of mines because uh, the local population there uh, is really into farming and tourism. And go against building mines that are open and which in their process of production use high needs and health on the environment and if uh, it is in order to build those mines we would need to deforest uh, the location or the land, but also the surface and the underground waters are also being negatively affected by the production or the building of these mines, which means uh, that the air, the land, and uh, the water would be polluted, as well as uh, the activities, the farming activities and the touristic activities that the population uses there would be stopped and they would have no way to exist. I believe that this is a very positive example how with a collaboration between the population, uh, the civic initiatives and the politicians, we as a Green Party were part of this fight, of this struggle against mining, and, and when we uh, discussed together with arguments, it was a very long process, and it wasn't easy, that fight wasn't easy, but as a result, we saw that the population together uh, with the politics and with the institutions uh, which are responsible for this area, who should uh, give support, we can achieve very good results. That is what happened in the end in Kazandó, was that the government took away the concession of the mine, and therefore that mine stopped being built, because it still uh, hadn't started being built. However, the concession for the exploitation of uh, mineral raw material was taken away. In the mine in Ilovica, which is also in first case, the government decided to take away, this took away the concession. However, the investors from the mining sector there appealed uh, appealed at the uh, courts. They uh, brought along a lawsuit. However, together with a, uh, however, with uh, fighting together, which was done uh, as uh, referendums of the population in that region, 
who said they did didn't want to have those kinds of mines built in their locations and through our activity with uh, discussions in the parliament and in the media and the civil initiatives who were like leaders in this fight, the protests, etc. We managed to take away these two confessions, especially because of uh, because Ilovic is already in a legal procedure and there is an ongoing lawsuit uh, to take this um, take this away, and we are constantly fighting and uh, monitoring what happens in that process. What is also very important and what we managed to achieve is that in this peri period, uh, during this fight with those two minds which were in their first phase killed and those concessions were taken away, uh, by the initiative of an MP, members of the parliament, to adopt the changes uh, in the law of mineral raw, of, uh, mineral raw materials and to uh, close those mines that use tiny and sulfur acid. This, uh, this result is a way of what are the in intentions of uh, the sectors and to encourage them to keep on investing and keep on doing ecological research researches uh, because there have been uh, dozens of uh, possibilities to do uh, researches and to see whether that investor would like to keep on looking for places where they would get concession. Therefore, this law is like a prevention of uh, future possible investors who would like to open new such mines which use cyanide and sulfuric acid in their production. What is also important in this whole process, and I believe it should be emphasized, is that the arguments of the mining industry or the mining companies, those are the companies that want to open uh, mines, one of their key arguments was that opening such a mine would bring about economical growth in the region, new uh, jobs for the population, and that it would practically be uh, in accordance with the economical growth of the region. This is unacceptable for us as well as for the local population. because not, this does not only offer new jobs, because the number of jobs in those mines would be much lower uh, than in uh, the open jobs of the citizens that work in the tourism and agriculture areas. Uh, the conditions are also very bad for the health of the workers because it's a very polluted industry. So uh, they had a very small support for these kinds of offers from the investors because the citizens uh, understood that these mines would not uh, only pollute the environment, but they would also have negative aspects when it comes to their economic wealth because they uh, are working in the farming and the touristic sectors. Therefore, I believe it is very important when we talk about just transition and green economy to em always emphasize that green economy doesn't only mean protection of the environment and the climate, but, as, but it also offers economical well being, especially for the uh, local population, because it is an opportunity or a potential for thousands of new green uh, jobs, which are decent for the workers, which don't have negative effects on their health. 
and that could uh, achieve economical well-being of the population. Because it is often questioned, and we have to choose between a common economy and between the protection of the environment and health, which is not true because this concept of development of green economy offers both possibilities together and that's the perspective for the development of the economy generally in the world because there isn't another uh, possibility we're being faced with one of the biggest catastrophes uh, looking at the long term, excluding the current COVID crisis as a very serious health and social economical crisis in the world. However, climate changes are still a threat towards the existence of the planet, to conserve our planet, and to give opportunities for life to the future generations, then this process of just transition is the perfect solution and it is necessary. I thank you all. I would like to leave more time about this topic, but as well as for the other uh, speakers. I hope that I will be able to follow the whole discussion until the end because uh, I would like to apologize in advance if I have to uh, turn off because we are currently in the parliament and there is a debate about the budget. So that's, and we will probably have to vote soon. So if I have to, I will have to turn off soon. Thank you very much, Maya. Thank you very much to you and to Bogdanovsky that today you took the time to be with us. It was well said by Maya in her presentation. However, we need to think about as a country which is not part of the EU, even though uh, these kinds of laws on mineral raw materials have been issued, this fight has to continue because green jobs are not in mind, but they're in other places. And we hope that in the future we will have more understanding from the government opposing to what we have now, and hopefully we'll have better and decent jobs. In another context, what was being mentioned in both presentations, I would like to call upon Anna Petrovska. She is the head of state environment in this country, uh, who will talk about uh, environmental inspections, a tool as a for just transition. Thank you, Ata. I'd like to say that uh, today these, the climate change is real. That's why the industry and the other pollutants should be responsible and not pollute uh, uh, and affect in a negative way the health of the, of the population. The fossil fuel technologies will not survive since they're reducing of emissions of pollutants such as PM particles, nitrogen and sulfur oxides through uh, waste gas uh, systems will not reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide. The reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions will be possible only through energy efficiency and fuel change. That is uh, forsaking fossil fuels and using renewable energy sources. The Environmental Inspectorate has a responsible role in these transition processes as it uh, monitors the, the work of the industrial and other types of installation, installations, uh, having in mind that uh, the emissions of polluting substances do not surpass their boundaries. Also, it assures that the installation implements various programs, including energy efficiency programs or the replacement of fossil fuels with renewable energy sources, which aim to reduce fossil fuel consumption 
and reduce uh, greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. As a new head of the Environmental Inspectorate, uh, this is my sixth day, I plan for the inspectors during the winter months, so where, when there is increased pollution, to conduct regular inspections and monitoring of major polluters, that is installations that have a integrated environmental licenses or permits. In November, we, in December, we will have extra inspection carried out on the minor polluters, that is those installations that have approved the environmental protection reports. The state inspectorate uh, in November and December will inspect uh, the installations that have B, uh, B integrated environmental permits by the Ministry of Environment and Spatial Plan Planning. Starting from this week, uh, we will start monitoring the uh, trade with waste oils that are and physical entities. Waste oils uh, contain polychronated biphenyls, which release cancerogenic pollutants during combustion. So any sale of these oils will be severely sanctioned. We will also monitor the import of waste tires and its combustion, uh, which also causes very harm harmful emissions. I expect that certain approved uh, statements uh, will have, have serious shortcomings in terms of whether uh, the working conditions are okay or not. Some integrated environmental permits will need to be revised. In that regard, during the following three to four months, I obliged my colleagues to thoroughly review the, the statements and the permits and uh, to revise them in order to enable those uh, the enforcement, the inspections to be improved and to improve the, the performance of the polluters. Finally, uh, we will ask the polluters to carry out energy controls, that is to implement an energy management system in accordance with the ISO 5001 standard in order to uh, improve their performances and uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. The environmental enforcement uh, need to be more efficient and more transparent. Through the monitoring, we want to influence uh, uh, and prevent uh, pollution. Regarding the transparency, we will provide uh, insights into the results of the conducted inspections and will facilitate the reporting of uh, irregularities. So, um, in order to protect the health of the of the population, we must uh, uh, ensure that uh, it will be our top priority. We know that um, the health of the population in these COVID times is very important, and I want to state that this uh, inspection is uh, very, uh, uh, if it's very well carried out, it will be very beneficial for the health of our citizens. And I'd like to ask for support by the citizens to act together and report any problems and pollutants in order to uh, for them to be sanctioned as soon as possible. Thank you. We're waiting for Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, sorry, I had some problems with the connection. Thank you very much, Anna. Now I'd like to 
I'll leave some time for questions. I'd like to open a discussion. We have a second session on energy democracy, which will take place in five to 10 minutes. So any questions till then? Miroslav? Good evening, everyone. I just want to say a few more things uh, that uh, to few, few more things about what Anna said. I support her and I'm at her service. The fight must go on. I believe that uh, we're about to uh, have a fierce winter and the pollutants must think of what they are about to do. Anna, you have my support. Good luck. <laughs> A few more questions for Anna. Alexander Angyushev. Anna mentioned that there will be a revision of the previous statements. Do you think that there may be a conflict of interest? I mean, uh, who will control those who control? How do you plan to, to do that? The re revision. Okay, so for tomorrow, we plan a, an inspection for which we had to read the integrated permit first. I wanted to offer some details on where we uh, managed to detect some shortcomings. So in a way, some emissions were legalized. I will not uh, mention the company in question since it will be an extra inspection. But I will definitely inform you about the, the outcomes of, of the inspection. We found out that there are some shortcomings regarding some directives. So after the inspection, after the enforcement, after once we get the results from the measurements we plan to, to do, after we intervene, of course, we will inform the Ministry of Environment since we have the right to do that. We have the right to tell the ministry that we have some findings and that our hands are tied, but we that we cannot do we cannot do anything but just inform them. So I don't think that they, there will be any conflict of interest. We are just a supervision. We just uh, control the situation and uh, just. Uh, analyze the conditions, the working conditions, and check if they are following the directives. So if the ministry doesn't want to uh, to issue certain permit, permit, what can be done? I think that no one has addressed the ministry regarding some change of uh, permit or uh, prevention of giving a permit. I consulted some experts and uh, ex some expert public experts, and I think that uh, we will collaborate with them and uh, manage to to solve certain issues. Okay, thank you, Anna. Ulgica? Anna, do tebe prašanje. Nekako sekupat imam čustvo koga 
Sme na vakvim panel diskusi i konferenci. Ona, every time we have such panel discussions and conferences, I get the feeling that we focus on the capital, 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 on
past, so do you plan to, to implement some of his practices? He punished certain pollutants for the first time, so as a, his punishment or his award, he was removed from the position in Skopje. He was in the city of Skopje for two years in the city inspectorate when he made many uh, positive changes in the dynamics of the of the work of the work and the, the functioning of the system. They set an e-platform through which the citizens could uh, follow the process of uh, enforcement. The citizens would know which inspector would go in which place and which co uh, companies uh, will they punish. So it was an example of complete transparency. The citizens took uh, direct, uh, directly, uh, were direct, directly included in the process. So do you plan to implement such tool again or something similar to this? Of course, those who are good at something, we should always follow them. Of course, I co cooperate with Miroslav. He supported me not just verbally, but also uh, he shared some experiences with me and taught me many things. So undoubtedly the platform that you just mentioned, the platform that informed the citizens on the enforcement um, is very useful. And of course I want to keep, uh, to keep it into practice. We are still developing a software. I'm still uh, discussing it and learning more things about it. I am getting very useful information and support and help from many uh, experts in the field. And I plan to use it as a tool to improve the, the work we do. I think that uh, Using that, these tools, the citizens will get will get to trust the institutions more, and of course we will keep cooperating with uh, Miro. And um, I think that it will be beneficial in the future. The colleagues have a huge respect for Miroslav. Uh, and I must say that I mind the fact that they keep comparing me uh, with him. I hope that I will try and uh, leave a mark as I had there as well. Thank you so much for the questions. We should uh, go on on the second session. However, we have one more question. I'd like to ask uh, the speakers to stay during the following session since it will also be an interesting topic. Dan has one more question, and after that, we'll, we will go on, on the next session. Hello, everybody. Congratulations, Svana Petrovska. I have no doubt that in the following period, she will be able to do a lot about the environment. I will be sure. comes to protecting those who tip off, I would like to ask a question. A lot of the citizens from my municipality are scared to tip off the companies. So what I want to know is uh, whether those people who tip off are protected, because there was a case a week ago uh, uh, when an MP uh, of uh, a neighbor of and he said that he was uh, called by the court as a witness because he tipped off that his neighbor was polluting. I'm wondering uh, what uh, the inspectorate's position on protecting these uh, people who tip off the pollutants. 
ovom predstavka od nekoj građanin ili nekoj prijavljivač, kako što ti se izrazi, Dejan. I must have a petition from a citizen or a whistleblower, and that petition is anonymous when it comes to the pollution that's been inspected. And it is about discretion of the inspectorate to not publish the name of the whistleblower. We are a very small region, so I can't guarantee that the name of the whistleblower won't be published and that discretion will be kept. There are all kinds of different situations and that's uh, out of uh, the law on uh, inspection. Maybe it's a part of a different area or uh, responsibility of different organs. However, thank you for emphasizing these kinds of problems, but that shouldn't uh, shouldn't unmotivate whistleblowers to uh, tip off pollutants. We, as an inspectorate and other organizations, for those whistleblowers, for those people who have decided to tip off the pollutants and then uh, use the tools that we have to uh, work in accordance to the procedures. Thank you. Voret, ti blagodara, Mana. Okay, thank you, Anna. I know that in uh, the conditions here, first of all, when Dick announced the topic, he did a great elaboration. However, in the European Union, it hasn't come to that level of a 100% just transition. However, it is obvious that here, not only in the parliament, where there is a fight for just transition that we are talking about, but it's also obvious that we all agree that the inspectorate will have a, or might have a huge role in, the, in that just transition. Because here, if you don't punish the companies, that would be the top of the area for the place we live in. Excuse me, Asa, I only have a question on this important topic. I have a question for Anna because you mentioned that their procedure starts with a petition. If a citizen tips off or gives a petition, it doesn't uh, matter in which way, whether through, uh, through email or archive or, or through the electronic platform that they built, and that's great. But I'm really interested whether the inspectorate can, without having a petition from a whistleblower, uh, because of its own finding, do an extra uh, inspection because they have their own tools that they implement. So I'm wondering whether without a petition, they can uh, do an inspection in a company. The law allows that Maya. However, the inspectors do not feel comfortable when they estimate uh, on their own and they decide that they have to go somewhere to do an inspection. They ask from the heads to give them a petition, which uh, lets them do the procedure. So if there is a so if there is a company that has to be inspected, but there is no petition, I can assign a certain inspector and let him realize and let him implement the inspection without having a previous petition from a whistleblower or however we call that person. So in any case, the head has the right to decide which inspector goes where according, uh, because of it, their doubts or because of doubts in the public. Thank you. Hvala mnogo. Zda, znam deka, znam deka na sitevi je mnogo aktuelna uh, i temata. I, uh, i... I know that this topic is very relevant. However, we're going to have to move on to the second part. Uh, 
the speakers from the first talk will remain as long as they can. That's the MPs as well for further question. 